We're going to continue in Acts 2 this morning, and I'm going to read our text starting in verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Well, amen. Uh, many of you didn't get to see. We had a baptism in the early service. We just celebrate that and praise God for his work in our midst. Uh, his name was Joel Barlow. He's a young man. He's been talking about his uh, faith and pursuing Christ for some time, and uh, we got to celebrate that with him today. Sorry you guys didn't all get to, to see that and be a part of it, but we celebrate together as the body of Christ. Now, we are in the New Testament book of Acts. We've been walking through just kind of seeing how God began to build his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a new phenomenon, though, because the church has never existed until the day of Pentecost happens. Peter stands up and preaches. He proclaims the gospel. He actually tells the Jews, um, you crucify the Messiah, and they're pierced to heart, uh, they repent of their sins, and they're ultimately baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Acts chapter 2, verse 41 tells us that, so then those who had received his word, they were baptized, and that day there were added 3,000 souls. And so, this is a big day, big opening day for the church, 3,000 souls added to their number. I'm not sure logistically how they pulled off all those baptisms in that short a time. They probably had a, you know, like a, an assembly line, just running them through people professing Jesus Christ, repenting of their sins. And listen, if you would have been in Jerusalem, you would have known that something profound was up. I mean, God had done this miraculous thing. They're, they were praying in the upper room. You hear this sound like a violent rushing wind, tongues of fire landing on people, people speaking in languages they don't even know. And then 3,000 people repenting of their sins and being baptized. This was a miraculous moment in the life of the church. We celebrate this. We know like this is profound and God did a, a miraculous work. But almost in the next breath, Luke, who wrote Acts for us, he turns his attention away from that big, miraculous, specific day, and he begins to focus on the day-to-day -day events that happened in the life of the church, the way that they began to conduct themselves, the things that they began to pursue, uh, the kind of the practices that they began to take up. If, if you have been a part of our church very long, you know that this passage in particular has informed much of our understanding about kind of who we're going to be as a church and the things that we're going to pursue together. So I'm delighted to get to share this with you, what we kind of see in this text, because we believe that it's these practices we're going to look at that began to strengthen and to build up the church, that they might be matured and ready, because just a, a, a short time from what we're going to see today, uh, there was a huge persecution that broke out in Jerusalem. And it was so brutal and so bitter that Christians, these brand new believers, uh, were really scattered all over the known world at the time. And even though they didn't get to gather anymore and listen to, you know, Peter and James and John preach, even though they didn't get to have kind of the, the same 3,000 person gathering that they'd had before, they took the gospel to every place in the known world. And I believe they took these specific practices with them. Now, what I'm going to be commending to you today, what I'm going to be pointing you toward is a little bit like what, what I did uh, when I was a young man. Um, seventh grade, which is, is where my son is now, um, he was, he's, he's measuring himself. You know, he's like, how tall am I? You know, how much do I weigh? And he's kind of looking forward to, to beefing up a little bit. And I got to share with him about my beefy self in the seventh grade. Uh, seventh grade, I was uh, not yet five feet tall, but I will tell you, I was a towering, beefy 82 pounds. Uh, I was a wrestler back then. I uh, wanted to be successful in sports, but as you can imagine, uh, at 82 pounds, I, I could only wrestle because at least there were weight classes, right? And so, but I decided I wanted to be a little more than that, you know? I wanted to be able to compete in football and other sports, and so, man, I started practicing hard. I started working out, and let me just tell you, it worked. But because by the time I was in the eighth grade, 
I was 89 pounds, y'all. Seven pounds in a year, solid muscle I must have put on. Uh, by the time I was a freshman in high school, I broke five feet tall and 100 pounds. I, I will tell you, I was a force to be reckoned with. Now, it didn't work all that well in my younger years. I have uh, officially uh, put on the weight that I so desired back then. Uh, but what I understood then and what we should understand about our faith is that if we want to mature and we want to grow, we want to beef up a little bit, then we're going to have to put in the work. There are certain practices or certain exercises that are going to cause us to mature and to grow stronger, to become more complete in our faith. And what I love about this passage is that these brand new believers, they just kind of automatically went about giving their lives to these specific things. And they began to pursue them. Uh, person after person after person, they all kind of in, in unison began to pursue these things. And God used these practices to mature them such that even when they were persecuted, they were, they were able to remain steadfast. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to talk to you about the six practices of a disciple. That's what we call them here. That's not what Luke calls them. We're going to look in this text, see these brand new believers and what they began to do. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42, here's what we see. <clears throat> says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, this word for continually here, uh, it, it, it's clarified. By the way, if you just kind of want to know how this text is arranged, you kind of get a snapshot of what they were doing in verses 42 through 45, and then like maybe zoom in a little bit more in verses uh, 46 and 47. And so here's what's happening. They begin devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, uh, when we talk about the apostles' teaching here, uh, they did not have leather-bound New Testament Bibles, right? Their grandma didn't give them a Bible with the, their name in the front of it on their first birthday. That's, that's not how this worked because they didn't yet have the New Testament as we have it. Now, many of these Jews would have had a, a significant understanding of the Old Testament, but from that understanding, they had rejected the Messiah, okay? So they've got a lot to learn, and they're giving themselves, devoting themselves continuously, day after day after day. That's what it tells us in verse 46. Day after day after day, they were continuing to give themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is the Word of God. Uh, the practice that we commend to our church here uh, is that of devoting daily that you would get into the Word of God every single day, that you would spend time as they did in prayer. And it wouldn't be like, you know, like kind of visiting in with God, uh, like you might check in on someone who's sick, you know, like in the morning, hey, how you feeling today? How's life? And then maybe at the end of the day, are things still going well? But instead, they were continually devoting themselves to the Word and to prayer throughout their day. What, what do the apostles teach? Hey, I'm in a new circumstance. How do the apostles teach me to live here? How would Jesus Christ teach us to live in this moment? Now, um, again, they didn't have the written word, and so they were gathering day after day, verse 46, you can see it, in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. This was in Solomon's colonnade, and it must, must have been quite a gathering. 3,000 people gathered together in the outer courts of the temple, Peter or James or one of the apostles preaching powerfully, all those people worshiping. I don't know how they organized this, but they pulled it all off. And they're hearing the teaching, and they didn't just hear. It wasn't like, all right, you know, Peter, well, well done, you know, thumbs up for the sermon. Got a little amen because you got, like, really good at one point. Uh, but instead, they would hear this teaching, and they would immediately begin to obey. You, you remember the Great Commission, right? This is what Jesus had told the apostles to do. Hey, I want you to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so these early believers, they truly believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They truly believed that life was found in him. And so they dramatically reordered their lives around obeying the teaching of the apostles. And so where the apostles would say, hey, here's what Jesus taught us. In the three years we spent with him, he taught us to love our neighbor. The early apostles would go out and begin to love their neighbor, help the poor. They began to help the poor, to serve one another, to care for one another. They were daily devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. These were the practices that they did. Listen, it's not as miraculous as what had happened on Pentecost, but day after day after day after day after day, 
devoting themselves to the word and prayer. They were being built up. This is like working out every single day. They're putting on some muscle, right? They're getting some beef in their life. They're beginning to mature in the faith. So the first practice, we call them the six practices of a disciple. The first is that of devoting daily. That is, believers in Jesus Christ who are indeed a part of God's church, just as these early believers were, that we would do as they did and give ourselves every single day to the Word of God. Now, prior to this moment, they would have been active in Judaism, working their jobs, living their lives. But when they came to faith in Jesus Christ, believing that true and abundant life was found in Him, they set other things aside. They reordered their lives around these things, the first of which was devoting daily. Now, the second thing that they did, which was kind of miraculous. This is really unique. There's not like a substantial precedent for this anywhere else. But they began to very naturally do was devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. The, the second one here is that of fellowship. So it kind of takes place in two settings. Um, the, the first setting is this corporate worship, right? They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching down in verse 46. is day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple um, every single day. They were going to gather together in the temple and listen to the apostles teach. They were going to hear the preaching, gathering together with the body. Uh, the second practice that we point everyone to in this church, we're like, hey, we want to make disciples of, of all people. We want to teach you how to walk in full obedience to be a fully devoted disciple of Jesus. We ask people, devote daily. And the second thing is to gather consistently. That for whatever reason, in the life of the American church, um, we have decided, you know what, we don't need to gather as much. We got life going on. We got hobbies, the lakes calling our name. We got all sorts of things that we want to be giving ourselves to. And less and less and less and less is the American church gathering together to encourage one another, to build each other up, to speak the gospel to one another, to sing together. This is verse 46. They were continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God together. Man, this, they were doing it every day, right? This, this is what they were going to give their lives to, encouraging one another in this big corporate worship gathering. But then they went a step beyond that. It wasn't just gathering consistently with a broader body, but instead they devoted themselves to a unique phenomenon in the first century, and I believe a unique phenomenon today. And that's this word in verse 42. Um, it's the word fellowship. Now, if you've been around for a while, you're like, fellowship, what do you mean? I've done that my whole life, right? Uh, I know what church is. When I was a kid, fellowship meant that we were going to gather in the fellowship hall. And just so you know, our church used to have an ice cream machine. And so fellowship meant ice cream. It meant that there was going to be a lot of good food. We were going to hang out. We are going to eat and lots of good dessert. And while um, I believe that fellowship should still continue to include really good dessert, um, it really doesn't do justice to the depth of this word to which these brand new believers began to devote themselves. All right, So the Greek word here is that of koinonia. And it gives us a picture of a deep, rich, abiding partnership together in one another's lives. It's not like, hey, I kind of know you, but it's I'm invested in you. It's not, you know, I, I passed you in, in, in service one day and, you know, we're, we're cool. But instead, it was an investment in each other's lives, which means that the things that concern you concern me. They began to participate in each other's lives. And so um, it, it gives this idea of intimacy, of knowing that other person deeply and being known deeply by them. So these men and women who would uh, devote themselves daily to the apostles' teaching, who would gather in the temple, they would also meet house to house, and they would break bread together, which is a sign of fellowship or friendship and mutual acceptance. They would, with gladness and sincerity of heart, they would take these meals together, praising God together. Uh, what they were doing was investing in one another's lives. And it wasn't kind of the shallow, like, hey, you know, I'm doing good, you're good, everybody's good, that, that we often do. But it was a, a level of knowledge and understanding of each other, of their strengths and their weaknesses, of their sinful tendencies and all of their gifts. And they would gather together to encourage one another, to build one another up in the faith, to urge each other on, stir each other up toward love and good works. That's what this fellowship was. And so these men and women, which Luke describes as men and women from every nation under heaven, they began to take on these practices meeting corporately in the temple. And then they begin, the, the way that we call it, the third practice, is that they committed themselves to community. 
to living life alongside other people, being invested in one another's life. And it wasn't a shallow level of investment. Look what it says here in verse 43. It says, Everyone kept feeling this sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who believed were together. Here's this together word again, right? All those who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, I'm just going to kind of put it straight. The American church is the wealthiest version of the church or the wealthiest generation ever to exist in the church. Like We have more disposable income, more resources, more stuff at our disposal than in the history of the church for the last 2,000 years. And yet it seems like, I'm just going to say it to you, rather than being reflexively willing to give to one another, to offer ourselves and invest in each other like this, people have to be in the church for five years before they're willing to give up even a penny. This church, these brand new believers understood that if they wanted to follow Jesus, if they wanted to know true and abundant life in him, it was going to cost them what they have. And so they began to give very radically to each other. Now, what this is not teaching is like communism, right? We need to own all things in common. That's what the the Bible would teach. But instead, what you need to know about these believers, when they came to faith in Christ, it cost them something, Many of these brand new believers would have been ostracized from their family. There would have been economic consequences for their decision to follow after Jesus Christ. They might have been shunned by their friends or their neighbors or relatives or even their, the people that they would have worked for. And so upon seeing need in each other's lives, rather than being like, hey, bless you, brother. Hope you have a good week and I'll be praying for you. They were like, you know what? There's a need over there and that's my brother and sister in Christ and I'm going to participate in their life I'm not going to do this deal where we all pass and we all say we're a part of the church, but we don't actually uh, live as a body. But instead, people went and sold their fields. They had additional property, additional money. They were giving to each other to support one another. This is the picture, the earliest picture of the church that we have. These are brand new believers who understood that their excess wasn't for them who understood that when God had blessed them, it wasn't just for them to keep it all, but instead they were supposed to bless others. So they go sell the field, they go sell the property, and they would bring it and they would share with anyone as they had need. When I talk to you about community, when we say we want you to be a part of a community group in our church, we are not telling you to go to another Bible study. We're not telling you just to have a meal and hang out and fellowship for a little while. We are asking you to invest in each other's lives in this way. And in my community group, we have had the joy of celebrating wonderful things together. I've been able to baptize some of the young people in our community group. There are days where we've celebrated marriages being restored. And let me just tell you, there are days that we have had to weep together, to mourn together through the difficult things of life. My community group, they know my struggles with sin and they know how to pray for me. I know the things that I can can do well in the areas that I can can lead in the areas that I probably should never, ever touch or try to lead in. We're invested in one another's life, just as the early church. When we talk to you about community, this is what we're asking you to do. So we say, devote daily, gather consistently, and commit yourselves to community. This means for better or for worse, that day in and day out, you walk through life with a group of people. They didn't try to do it, all 3,000 of them at one time, right? They gathered Solomon's colonnade, and then they went house to house with a group of people that they can know and love and trust and walk through life with. The fourth thing that we encourage people to do is to give sacrificially. We certainly see that evidenced here, that we would understand as the American church how blessed we are. I don't don't know if you've seen in the news about the church in Afghanistan. Y'all. We are profoundly blessed. We have the freedom to gather and assemble. And we get to go eat together after this without any fear of persecution. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are hiding in caves and in friends' homes. And they're praying that they're not discovered. And they're in danger of being martyred for their faith, even as I preach this message. And somehow, rather than having the heart of Jesus Christ, y'all remember the, the story of the Good Samaritan? 
to where the Good Samaritan Jesus is teaching what it looks like, like who's our neighbor, how should we love people. And he, he tells the story of a man who was traveling down from Jerusalem, and he falls into uh, some trouble. Some thieves along the road, they, they beat him up, they steal his stuff, and they leave him for dead. And Jesus tells a story about the priest who comes by. And a priest, fairly religious fellow, you would assume, right? But the priest is busy with all of his religious duties. And so rather than meeting the man's needs and caring for him, he, uh, he passes by on the other side of the road. Strengthened further, Jesus tells about a Levite, who, again, these are like the, the priestly class of people that were born into this. Sees the man there, passes by on the other side of the road. And he tells about the Samaritan who sees the man there in the ditch, and he's suffering and he's bleeding, and he's near death. And he goes and he begins to care for him. He gets off of his donkey and puts the man on it, which means the other guy got to ride while he had to walk. He bandages the wounds up. He provides care to this man. He walks with him to an end and says, listen, pay for him to stay as long as he needs to. If it's going to cost more, I'll come back and take care of it. Jesus is like, this is what it looks like for you to love your neighbor. You get your hands dirty. The things that concern them concern you. You go and care. You go and serve other people in this way. Y'all, it's really easy for us in America with all of our affluence, with all of our opportunities. We got jobs. We got incomes, right? We got promotions that are waiting. We got our kids are involved in ball, and they're all going to be superstars, right? We got all sorts of things going in our lives, and it's easy for us to be like, yeah, I don't see that going on over there. Listen, I'm just, I'm living my life. I got a lot going right now. I'm just going to get to church on Sunday and call it good. We're going to be like these early believers. We don't walk past the person in the ditch. We don't ignore the suffering of the church in Afghanistan or the person that we see on the street here. We give our life to them. And listen, we're not just trying to get your money here. We want you to give sacrificially to this body. We believe in the mission and the work that we're doing here. But we also want you to open your wallet and care for the people that you see every single day. People that are hurting. Listen, in our schools... There are kids that don't have clothes to wear, shoes, they don't have food. We are the church. We are God's plan A to meet these needs. And so part of being a part of Cross Community Church, we would call on you to, to covenant together with this body that you are going to give sacrificially, that you're going to live differently than the rest of America and our world. And rather than thinking of ourselves and what we can do for uh, our, our kids, instead we would say, man, we're going to live as Christ. Remember that we are the church that are the beneficiaries of the sacrificial work of Jesus, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, would have everlasting life. And just as God has given sacrificially to us, we would give sacrificially to other people. Devote daily. Gather consistently. Commit to community. Give sacrificially. The fifth one is serving faithfully. That you would understand, as the Bible would teach us, that if you are in this church, that God has given you a spiritual gift, if not plural gifts. And those gifts are given for the building up of the body of Christ. Paul describes it as a body with many parts. He's like, hey, there's an eye, there's a hand, there's a foot. And when all those parts are functioning well, man, the church is unstoppable. The gates of hell will not overcome that church. These are brand new believers that literally started the revival that that we are here today as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ and how the Spirit used them. They came together and they served one another faithfully. There were people that opened up their home. The apostles were going to be the ones that would preach. Others would lead in prayer. Some had gifts of mercy. Others were the ones who had tons to give and they were able to sell fields and help tons of people. They offer to God what they have. Listen, when when we talk about serving faithfully here, we're not asking you to develop some gift that you've never been given. We're not asking you to, you know, to become someone you're not. But we're asking you to offer to God what you have. Like the little boy who was present when the crowds were hungry. He didn't have enough food to feed the crowds. He didn't have the means to go out and buy more. But he offered Jesus Christ what he had. And God took that, and he fed the masses on that day. And so what we would ask you to do as the church, listen, we're no different from these men and women. 
our names are different, but we're just as much the church of Jesus Christ as they were. So they offered God what they had. I got a house. Hey, I can cook. I've got some money for food. I can care for the poor. Man, I'll visit people who are in prison. And as a result of them living life in this unique way, if you look down at verse 47, it talks about the, the church praising God and having favor with all the people. You know what happens when you devote yourself to Jesus Christ daily? Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. Jesus, it's not my will but yours be done in this life. I want to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and trust you with the rest. And I'm going to gather consistently with the body of Jesus Christ to worship and to be encouraged together. I'm going to commit to my life to living in community with other believers who can stir me on to love and good works. I'm going to give sacrificially. And I'm going to serve other people faithfully. You know what happens in the community? And people look at us with favor. They look at us as a unique and distinct people rather than just a bunch of people who show up at a, on a building one time a week on Sunday. Y'all, this is being the church of Jesus Christ, not just attending. And they enjoyed favor with the people. Now, this next part isn't written in here. And I couldn't tell you specifically what happened. But here's what I know. These brand new believers in Jesus Christ who just said, we're going to devote ourselves to these things. Day after day after day, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to gather with the body. I'm going to commit myself to community. I'm going to serve. I'm going to give. They were enjoying favor with all the people. And God used these people who had just crucified his son. People had missed it so bad that they crucified the Messiah that was there to save them. God began to use them to draw people to faith in Jesus Christ. And so what we see uh, happening among the early church says, And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Day after day after day after day, another man whose eternity was forever changed. Another young child who came to faith in Jesus Christ another young girl, another old person that came to faith in Jesus Christ and their eternity was forever shaped. They began to live out the abundant life in Jesus Christ. Here's my question for you. Have you, 2,000 years after these people came to the conclusion, have you come to the conclusion that seeking after and knowing Jesus Christ, that seeking first his kingdom is like the great treasure hidden in a field? That because you found this thing, because you found Jesus Christ, because you found his kingdom, you're willing to give up all the other things and do as these believers did and dramatically reorder your life around seeking after Jesus Christ and being one of his disciples? Or is Jesus just another thing to you? It's really not worth reordering anything It's not really worth changing your schedule or your life or being in community with other believers. It's not really worth your money, serving, giving up your time. Here's what I would plead with you. And it's what Peter pled to these new believers back up in verse 40. He said, be saved from this perverse generation. Everything in this world is going to tell you that you need more money, you need more fame, you need more stuff, you need more power or more influence, and then your soul will be satisfied. Jesus said, no, no, no. And the kingdom of God is the one thing that will satisfy your souls. I'm going to give you living water that you won't thirst again. And if you will seek first the kingdom of God, All of those other things will be added to you. God is going to take care of you. God is going to write your story. God is going to do a profound work for you. Just imagine as you think about the end of your life, what you want to be said about you. Did you kind of go through life living out the American dream? Raising a few kids, got your house and a few cars, retirement fund is all good. Or do you want to look back on the last day of your life and know that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, 
that it all belonged to him. And you can look back and know that it wasn't you, but in spite of your weaknesses and your failures and your shortcomings, God used you to transform a generation and a family or a city or a workplace that you look back and your legacy is that you have built the kingdom of God, that you've been used by him to transform a generation. Church, we have every opportunity to be used of God. So my call to you today is to give yourself to the things that these brand new believers gave themselves to. If you're here today and you've never really given, if anything, you've given your leftovers, I want to call on you to begin giving sacrificially in obedience to Jesus Christ. Whether you put it in our offering plate or not, would you begin to give sacrificially and watch what God does? Would you begin to serve other people faithfully? in your workplace and in your home and in this body. If you, if you want to serve here, we would love to have you. But just offer yourself to God. Be like, hey, I don't have a lot, but God, here's what I have. And just watch as God begins to use you. Would you take the time to devote yourself to Jesus Christ daily? Don't just hear the words of Scripture. Begin to walk in obedience to those things. The, the sixth practice of a disciple is that you would engage missionally. And that means when you leave this place, you would do what the sign says. And you would go and be the church of Jesus Christ. That you would love people as Jesus Christ has loved you. Serve them as Jesus has served you. Give to them as Jesus has given unto you. And we just look forward. We don't know what's coming. And we're going to labor. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to do great things. We may experience suffering. And we may experience a harvest. Man, the kingdom of God is worth giving it all up for. Jesus said, hey, you want to find life? Give your life up for me. Would you bow with me? Father, we're thankful uh, for the example and this testimony that we have in your word of these brand new believers who just reflexively in response to the good news of Jesus Christ that you had died on the cross for their sins, that you spent three days in the grave and rose again, sent your spirit to live within them. God, they began to live as your disciples in obedience to your word. Oh, God, that you might make that true of us. God, help us. God, help us. Help us to fix our eyes on you that we might not play church. Might not just go through the motions, but we might be the church of Jesus Christ. Oh God, would you have your way in us? I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.